Father, we've been singing the truths of who you are in our praises, in our worship songs, and we've recited your word together, and now we're asking you to speak to us. We need to hear from you. And I pray that it would not just be me speaking, God, but you'd speak through me what we each need to hear. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What were the last words you spoke this morning? Can you remember? How many of you know immediately what your last words you spoke came out of your mouth? How many of you cannot remember the last words you spoke, what they actually were? How many of you aren't listening? <laughs> Any hands go up? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many uh, words you speak in a day on average? Do you know how many words you speak in a week or in a year? Do you know the, uh, the average person will spend, if you were just to take all the words you speak in a lifetime and just play them in a, on a track, it would c come out to about one-fifth of your life. The average person spends a fifth of their lifetime talking in a year. If you were to take all the words you speak in one year, on average, they would fill 100 books of 200 pages each. There's a lot more probably for me, who I speak for a living, but we talk a lot. There's a lot of talking going on in the world today, wouldn't you agree? Now, if you're the introverted type, maybe you have one book less. My point is, we all do a lot of talking. We don't even know what we say. Case in point, most of you are like, I'm not sure exactly what I said. What did I say? Or you know what you said. You don't want to admit what you said a few minutes ago before you walked in here. We do a lot of talking, but what do all these words amount to? What do they add up to? What's the point or the purpose of all of these words? What are they producing? We're accomplishing. Given all the talking and all the words coming out of our mouths, all the tongue wagging going on, it should not surprise us that God's word would have something to say about our words. That shouldn't be a shock to us. And in fact, he does. And in this series uh, on the book of James, James's letter to the church, the Christians scattered around the Roman world. As we've said, James's primary concern is not so much your theology or doctrine. He assumes you know who Jesus is. His primary concern is, what does this look like in your life? Practically speaking, everyday life. What's more practical or everyday than the words we speak? And so we're going to look here at what James has to say to us about our tongue and about our words. If you have your Bible open to James chapter 3, we'll read the first 12 verses of James 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. It's pretty clear. James is, doesn't, he's, he, James is not trying to be uh, obtuse or, or uh, mysterious. He's very direct in what he wants to say. We've seen that already in the course of studying this letter this summer. And he's direct here also about our words. But the first one is a little bit strange. He says, you shouldn't presume to be teachers because you'll be judged more strictly. Well, what does that have to do? If you're thinking, well, that's not me. I'm not presuming, so I'm off the hook. Not so fast. He, it's telling us that God takes words very seriously. And the more words you use, the more severely you'll be judged. Especially when you're in a position to use those words to influence other people. Especially if you're in a role as a school teacher, a coach, a mentor, a teacher in church, a pastor, a leader in the community, or in your home. All of you have influence. 
And what James is saying to us is the greater you use those words to influence, the more responsibility you have for what you say. So we should be very careful who we listen to and what we say. And James is really continuing or developing in more detail what he said a number of times already. In chapter 2, he says, So speak and so act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What he means is, talk like people who've experienced grace. Talk like people who get Jesus. And then in verse 119, James chapter 1, verse 19, we didn't cover this in detail weeks ago, but he says, let everyone be slow to speak and quick to listen. Just think about that for a minute. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. It's no secret that our culture is exactly the opposite, isn't it? We're living in a culture where we operate by the opposite principle. We're quick to speak. We're so quick to criticize, so quick to demonize those who we disagree with or hold different viewpoints, so quick to presume that we know enough to speak like we have authority. And we're so slow to listen to each other. This is true like in, in conversation, on social media, just in our culture in general. Now let me, before we get into the some of the points here. I, I just want to make a confession. Sometimes I get apprehensive and anxious about preaching a text because I don't feel like I know it well enough yet. I have a lot of studying to do in the culture, in the background, but that excites me. I like that part of it. I feel competent and excited to study the text to, to bring to you God's Word. Other times I get anxious and nervous to preach because I feel like I don't, I'm not living this. This is one that needs to be preached to me, not from me. And I want to just tell you, this is an area where God is really working on me, where he's well, there's lots of areas where he's working on me, but this is one of them, right? Where my, my words don't honor God or bless others the way I would want them to or the way God wants them to, enough. He's got, he's got my, my mouth needs a makeover, in other words. I, I have some growing to do, perhaps you do as well. I've been convicted by that in preparation for the sermon. But I've also been encouraged that God's not done with me. Like, even in the preparation, even in recognizing some things that, are, that I've been saying that, and some p patterns of behavior with my, my words that aren't healthy and aren't good, I had to confess some things to my own family. I felt like, in a way, that was God saying, see, I'm not done with you either. There's good news here. And hopefully you hear that as well, not just guilt or condemnation, but good news. Okay, first, the power of the tongue. There's tremendous power in words. Words matter. They carry immeasurable significance. The world was created by God speaking it into existence. We know who God is by the revelation of him through his word. Jesus is called the living word made flesh. Jesus speaks and people are healed and demons are cast out. Christians, we worship God by speaking and hearing and singing his word. We've been doing that. Words matter. They matter in life. Wars are fought over words, or misunderstandings of words anyway. In fact, there's this lesser known story about the World War II, uh, the battle in the Pacific. The U.S. issued an ultimatum to the Empire of Japan saying that if they did not comply and give up their territories and their, and their, their aggressive expansion uh, and surrender, that we would respond with prompt and utter destruction. Prime Minister Kentaro Suzuki replied with a single word in Jap Japanese, mokusatsu. That's a compound word, and he intended it to mean no comment. But the word literally means kill with silence. And it was interpreted by the U.S. and British media as like a, a, a word of contempt, like your threat is not worth us speaking about or responding to. Ten days later, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. I'm not saying the word caused it, but I didn't even know that. One word, taken one way, has great power. In fact, from my own personal life, years ago, there was a, a woman who had spoken in our church uh, on marriage and, and, and sexual purity and to a bunch of students, and it came out that she led a ministry, and it came out in the media that she had been through a divorce uh, and, and was unfaithful or some thing like that, or her husband was unfaithful to her, and there was a big blow up over whether she was qualified or not to speak on this, and she'd already been to our church. And I sent her a letter, and I wanted to encourage her, saying that, and I, and I wrote these words in my email, or my, my type letter, I am not condemning you, but I left out one word, the word not. I typed, I am condemning you, and I sent her the letter, thinking, how encouraged will she be, and built up. The power of a word, even a missing word. 
I, I corrected my mistake after much misunderstanding, tears, and apologies. Words are powerful. Let me read verses 3 through 5 again from James chapter 3. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they also obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they're large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The, the image of the bit in the mouth of a horse and the rudder of a ship are talking about direction, guiding, making something move in a particular direction. James is telling us something important there. I, I, uh, the Miller family who attends the Mill Creek campus, they've got horses and they're into equine life or whatever. And I, got, I, see, I see these 12-year-old girls that get on these 1,000-pound quarter horses and they make the 1,000-pound animal go where they want. James is saying, the tongue looks like a small thing, but don't be deceived. It has great power, and it causes a particular direction in your life. Words have power. Whoever invented the nursery rhyme, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me, was probably deaf. <laughs> Seriously. What a terrible thing to teach kids. You know words go deep into our, into our hearts and souls. They stay with us. Or the one that we used to say when I was a kid. I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. That's not true either. <laughs> James uses the image of a bit in the mouth of a horse to say that words direct us. They direct our lives and the lives of others. The words you speak are moving you in a particular direction. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says that the death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. That's pretty extreme. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life, the words you speak, are moving you in one direction or another, quite literally. Are you speaking words of death or words of life? I'm reading a book by Brady, Pastor Brady Boyd, New Life Church in Colorado. It's called, the title of the book is Speak Life. It's challenging me and convicting me and encouraging me. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, your tongue, your words, and mine. And one of the ways I've noticed this in my own life and in others, I think that I, I will say sometimes, I like sarcasm. My wife and I, it's a spiritual gift we have. We're good at sarcasm. We have little battles of sarcastic comments back and forth. And sometimes it bleeds out into our kids or people that are around us, and I like to joke around. So sometimes I'll say harsh things. Sometimes, you know, things that are, are teasing a little too much. Sometimes even cruel things without even meaning it. And then, I'll, you know what, I'll, what I put on the end to make it okay? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's just a joke. Come on. Don't take it so seriously. Just joking. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Let me read to you from Proverbs 26. It won't be on the screen, but Proverbs 26. Like a madman who throws firebrands and arrows and death is the one who deceives his neighbor and says, I am only joking. What? <laughs> the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down in the inner parts of the body. Talking about gossip. How many of you can recall words that wounded you? Show of hands. Anybody? Every one of us. My dad's in his 70s. He tells the story still today with a little wry smile, but also still tells it about his fifth grade teacher who caught him carving his initials into the bottom of his desk, one of those desks that lifted up. And his teacher came over to him and said, Joseph Frazier, you are dead weight to the world. Fifth grade boy, still tells that story. 60 years later. Of course you remember where's that wound. We all do. They go down deep and they take a long time to heal. By contrast, how many of you can remember words that blessed you? Words that gave life to you, that encouraged you when you needed it most? Anybody? Sometimes those are harder to remember because we've been wounded by other words. I treasure the words my wife's grandfather Douglas Johnston, he's passed away, he's with Jesus now, he's a Baptist pastor for 52 years. He's six foot six and he pitched with the Cardinals with Dizzy Dean. And he gave it up to go into ministry. The story he tells, he was in the, he was in the hotel lobby 
after a, on a Sunday, and they, he couldn't go to church because they were playing somewhere, and he was reading his Bible, and Dizzy Dean came in with an entourage after being out drinking all night and said, Johnston, that was the, my wife's maiden name, what are you reading? He said, I'm reading the Bible. He's a rookie pitcher, and here's Dizzy Dean, this famous pitcher. And he goes, you don't believe that blank, do you? He says, I sure do. Why? And he starts to explain the gospel to him, and Dizzy Dean says, uh-uh, you have to buy us all a drink to tell us about Jesus. So he did. He bought him all a round of drinks and told him about Jesus. He said in that moment he realized he was called to ministry, not to baseball, and he gave it up and went to seminary. He's a man I admired in his ministry for 52 years. He came to hear me preach when I was a young youth pastor, maybe my second or third time I'd ever preached. He sat in there, and I know that it was terrible. I know. I have the tape. I've heard it. It was terrible. And afterwards, we went out to eat, and you know what he said to me? He could have said a thousand things about things I could have done better, easily, and I would have listened. He didn't say any of that. He encouraged me. He blessed me. He affirmed my sense of calling. He said, you're in the right place. People need to hear the word of God from you. I've never forgotten that. It's over 20 years, 22 years ago. Words have power. The power of life and the power of death is in the tongue. But there's a problem, James says, the problem of the tongue. Now, he's not saying get control of your mouth before it gets you into trouble. He's saying, actually, you can't on your own control it. It's untamable. G.K. Chesterton called the tongue the two-ounce untamable beast. He's right. Let me read verses 6 through 10. Again, of chapter 3. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. With it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. Verse 7 says, we can tame almost any kind of wild creature. I was thinking about this. I don't know if anybody's tamed the blue whale, but we do see, like, you know, orcas in the, on performance. So, I mean, it, it might be somewhat of a torical flourish, but the point is made. All kinds of things we can, by ingenuity and power and our own effort, bring under control, rein in, tame. Although Siegfried and Roy, they try to tame lions, and I forget which one almost got eaten. Roy, Siegfried, got his face bit off. So anyway, that's not the point James is making. <laughs> you get his point. The tongue, little bitty thing we can't tame, and does more damage, ultimately speaking. How many of you have at one time or another said something, and immediately after it came out of your mouth thought, why did I say that? Where did that come from? Anybody? Some of you are going, yes, some of you are going like this, yes, you have said that. Right? Right? What, why did I say that? I know what that's going to cause. James says the tongue is full of deadly poison. And it leaks out, even when we don't want it to. You might be able to rein it in for a time, stop saying certain words, avoid certain things, but you can't really tame it. In Ephesians 4, 15, the Apostle Paul says we should speak the truth in love to one another. That phrase, truth in love, is really helpful if you think about it. So words are damaging. Words are poisonous. Words, words cause damage when they are either untruthful and or unloving. They have to have both to speak life. So, so the person who says, there are some kind of people, in the church especially, who say the truth at the wrong time and in the wrong way, and then think, well, I did my job, not my problem that she's freaking out. It is your problem, and you did not do your job, because you didn't speak the truth in love. Your goal is not to bash people with the truth, it's to love people with the truth. On the other hand, there's another kind of person, and some of you are this kind of person, who thinks... I don't want to say this. I know they need to hear it, but I, I know how this will go. They're not going to like me anymore. They're going to get angry. They're going to avoid me. They're going to hurt their feelings. So I won't say it. That's not loving. Truth without love is not actually truthful because people don't receive it. And love without truth is not actually loving. You don't love them enough to tell them the truth. Our words should contain both truth and love. This is what God's word is to us. It's not all nice and, you know, unicorns and roses and rainbows and tying bows in your hair and everything's nice and make you feel good. 
I don't know if I said unicorns. <laughs> this truth, there's a hard edge to it, but it's also full of grace and love. Words of life have both. This is a pretty good filter for our words. To think before you speak, is what I'm about to say truthful? Is what I'm about to say loving? Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says these words. Every time I read them, I get a little shudder, and I think you should too. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Gasp. I've got a lot of accounting to do. There's been a lot of careless words spoken in my life, and I'm guessing in yours as well. I know I've spoken many words that were careless and hurtful, sometimes intentionally. So this is the problem of the tongue, right? It causes all kinds of trouble, and we can't tame it. We can't ultimately control it. So what are we going to do? I know. Jesus says in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Should we cut off our tongue? Actually, one time, uh, this is somewhat related. When, um, years ago, uh, after, uh, when I was um, done playing football in college, and then I played briefly in the Arena Football League, um, you could take that on faith, but I used to be able to play a little bit. And uh, I was playing in a rugby league. Some guys had recruited me to play for the Chicago Shamrocks in rugby. I didn't know how to play rugby, but I was learning. And we're playing in a game, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I went to tackle this guy, and his knee came up right under my chin, and I bit down on my tongue so hard, I bit almost three-quarters of the way through my tongue. Bit it almost off, barely hanging there. Well, in rugby, they don't really care. They're like, eh, you know. It's tough to be you, but just kept playing. I'm spitting blood out as fast as I can. My mouth is filling up with blood as fast as I can spit it out. I had to drive myself to the emergency room. My tongue is hanging by a little fleshy thread. I got to the emergency room. My mouth is full of blood. I, and I'm looking at the lady at the reception. She's like, what's your, sir? What is your problem, sir? I'm like, Bleh. I grabbed her coffee mug and went, Bleh. spit all the blood in there. She's like, ah! So she could let me inside. And I had 12 stitches in my tongue. I was supposed to give a sermon a week later at a camp. I'm like, Bleh. 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 <laughs> so bad. That's, that's not really the solution, right? Bite your tongue off or cut it off and throw it away. What is the solution? The transformation of the tongue. Back in verse 2, James says, For we all stumble in many ways. I like that one. I underline and highlight that one. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. A little sarcasm there almost. Because nobody is. Nobody does not stumble ever. Especially with their words. What's he saying there? He's saying there's no greater evidence of your need for grace and the words that come out of your mouth. There's no greater evidence that you need the grace of Jesus than the stuff you say. What's to be done? Well, if you look at the end, verses 11 through 12, James gives us a little hint of the real transformation of the tongue. He says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What's he saying here? He's saying what you're saying, your tongue, your words, are actually revealing something much deeper. The issue isn't actually your tongue. It's where those things are coming from. There's a much deeper problem. He's echoing the words of his older brother, his older half-brother Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke 6, verses 43 through 45, Jesus says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. And this is his last verse. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Your translation might say, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is the real issue. It's not just get yourself to stop saying stupid things. It's where's that coming from in me? What is, where, what's the source of that? I talked to a man who came to see me years ago because he, he didn't know why he would freak out at his youngest son, overreact, and he was full of kind of guilt like I'm a bad father. We talked about some things, and I said, well, what's the issue? So, well, my son's very excitable. He gets all excited, and when he gets excited, I, I kind of blow up at him, tell him to calm down all the time. My wife is like, why are you crushing his spirit? He goes, I don't know why. 
It took a while to get to it, but when he was a little boy, they moved around all the time when he was young. He'd go to a new town and try to make new friends. And trying to get in with a group of friends, one of the friends said to him, so-and-so, you're such a spaz. He said that phrase crushed him and stayed with him for years. And he didn't even realize that every time he sees his son acting like he perceived he was acting, he freaks out and tries to squelch it because he doesn't want him to get teased and made fun of like he did. Do you see the power of a word? You're such a spaz. Goes deep in your heart, stays with you. It impacts how you parent your kid years later. The transformation is not just don't say bad things or harsh things to your son. It's what's going on in your heart that's stirring that makes you speak that way or in my heart. I remember reading through the World Harvest Mission discipleship course years ago. We were gleaning some things out of there to use in a discipleship program I was involved in. And they had an assignment in there. They, each week was a different assignment. And one of their weeks for their missionaries' assignments was, for one week, say nothing that boasts about yourself, say nothing to defend yourself, say nothing to elicit compliments from somebody else to yourself, Say nothing that disparages somebody else, gossips about somebody else, or would hurt somebody else. That's ridiculous. For a week? I can't make it a day, can you? I, 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 all seriousness, I'll give you a challenge. Tomorrow, half a day, 8 to 2. Take that challenge. Say nothing to boast, to defend yourself, or to try to, you know, elicit a compliment. Say nothing that gossips or speaks negatively about anybody else. Try it from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. tomorrow. And just see how you do. Take note of all the impulses to speak that are selfish, that are fearful, that are anxious, that are insecure. You'll be amazed and convicted. But this is actually good news, friends. It's actually good news. Because if you don't recognize that stuff in you, not just the, how many of you have said this before? Guys, let me just talk to guys for a minute since I am one. Men, particularly married men, but all guys, have you ever found yourself saying things that you regret? Show of hands. Get your hands up, liars, right? <laughs> right? And have you ever said to yourself, oh, I'm so sorry, I, 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 I'm not doing that anymore, either out loud or to yourself, I'm not doing that anymore, I'm not gonna say that anymore. Show of hands, right? How many did it again? <laughs> How does this happen then? We've got to go deeper than just the stuff we're saying. What do your words reveal about your heart? I want you to think about that for just a minute. Right now, what do the words you say reveal about the one you say resides in you? Because until you and I can see it for what it is, we can't confess it. And if we can't confess it, Jesus won't deal with it. If we're not aware of it. Blind spots are called blind spots for a reason, right? If we're not aware of it, we can't confess it. Once we confess it, he can begin to deal with it and heal it and transform it and help us see where that's really coming from. That's why it's good news. It's not to shame you, you know, shape up, get control of your tongue, speak better. That's not the point. The point is that's coming from somewhere. I want to be what Jesus calls a wellspring of life, overflowing with his love and speaking that to people. I want you to be that way. What if, what if we were a community that we were just sort of known in our community for the way we talked? You know, years ago, I was a volunteer football coach at a local high school. One of the things I noticed about the guy coaches in the locker room is they don't talk that great about their the players or their wives. So at first, I tried just not to engage in that. I'm just not going to talk bad about my wife. So I just sat there silent, listening to him. Then I thought, you know what? I'm going to go the other direction. I'm going to find ways to talk about how great my wife is around them. Huge, it was hilarious. They would say, make some offhanded joke or quip about the ball and chain or whatever. They were just saying some terrible thing, you know, try to be funny, locker room talk. And so I would say something like, well, my wife is great, you know. And they would be like, they just looked at me like, Get out. You know, I didn't say that, but it just didn't fit. My point is this. It was so countercultural. It was so different. It stood out so much. What if we just stood out? Because we don't fish for compliments. We don't boast about ourselves. We look for the good in others and bless them with our words. 
We talk about the grace of Jesus in our lives openly, winsomely, freely. People who are so transformed by grace in our hearts that we can't help talking about it, that our words are filled with it. That's the kind of man I want to be. You know, in verse 6, just to close, um, James says, he uses the image of a fire. The tongue is a fire, he says. Talk about destruction. Is that just a rhetorical flourish? The tongue is a fire, a raging fire. Well, I don't think so. I think he's saying something deeper there. Because there's two kinds of fire in the Bible. There's the fire that burns and destroys, and there's the fire that refines and purifies. And in Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, when the first Christians, the disciples, the believers were all together in one place, and the Spirit came on them in power, and they were filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak the words of God, the gospel, words of life to each other, what appeared above their heads? We just finished the Holy Spirit series. Tongues of fire. I think James is referencing something here. The transforming grace of Jesus Christ comes into your life, and here is His Spirit fills you. Your, word, your tongue, your words get set on fire, not to destroy, but to refine, to bless, to spread like wildfire the goodness of His love. What if Chapel Street Church, we became a community known for our words of life, known for encouragement and blessing? What if people were drawn to us because we just talk different? about each other, about God, about them. People felt safe around us because we're not, we're not interested in talking about people behind their back or fishing for compliments or taking little digs. We just want to bless people because think about it. Jesus Christ, the living word made flesh, God's word to you is grace. God's word to you is love. God's word to you in Jesus. The cross is God's word to you. I love you. I made you. I forgive you. I want a relationship with you. That's the words I want to speak. Let's pray. Father God, we, we ask you to forgive us for our careless words. We recognize that James is right. Even though we might be able to stop for a time, we really can't control our tongues. We also see, Lord... That taming the tongue is about transformation of the heart. And only you do that. So we're asking you, Jesus, to complete the work you've started by changing our hearts that we might speak words of life and love and grace. Words of your gospel. We pray this in your name. Amen.